Good morning from Paris. We are here on a two-day layover as we make our way home after visiting the country of India. Today is the day we get to go out and explore the city. Our hotel is located in a super great area, so we're within walking distance of all of the best things to see in Paris. I made us an itinerary. We are going to the Shakespeare and Company Cafe, which is an English-speaking bookstore. We're going to Notre Dame, Saint-Chapelle, the Louvre, and last but not least, the Eiffel Tower. On our layover out to India, we went to the very top of the Eiffel Tower. Tower. Today we're not going to be doing that, but we do need to see it at night to see it sparkle. It's a little bit after nine, so we are going to head out and hit things as they open. Our first stop is the Shakespeare and Company bookstore. We're only a few steps from our hotel and it's kind of drizzling out, so we already broke out the rain jackets. But it's very nice here. We're just seeing the shop start to open and it's November, so it's Christmas and we're seeing decorations and Christmas trees line the streets, but it's pretty much a straight shot. We're almost there. We stopped and bought an umbrella because the rain is starting to come down and we want to make sure that we stay dry because we have a full day of activities. But as we're making our way over to the bookstore, we have gotten to Notre Dame, which is a famous Parisian cathedral. We're going to check out Notre Dame and get a little bit closer after the bookstore, but we're nearly there. And quite literally right across the street from Notre Dame is our first stop of the day, Shakespeare and Company's bookstore and cafe. This is one of the most famous and oldest English-speaking bookstores in Paris. Safe to say that we liked it. We finished both the hot chocolate, the matcha, and the cinnamon roll. Tasting cinnamon rolls across the United States and now across the world has kind of become our thing and that was a very delicious one. A lot of famous writers like Ernest Hemingway have come to this bookstore and you have views of Notre Dame from the second floor. The cafe itself was partnered with a New Yorker so there's a lot of bagels and American style coffees so we felt very much at home but with a very nice Paris twist. But now we're gonna go jump in line for the bookstore. There's already a line forming because this is such a popular place and we wanna make sure that we can get a book from here because there's a very special reason why. We're not allowed to film inside the bookshop but we'll be able to show you our purchase when we get back out. I'd rather walk than race My only run is running late I slowly mosey in no hurry no at my own pain we have just finished up our time in the Shakespeare and Company bookstore. It was really, really just an amazing place. We got the special edition Hunchback of Notre Dame that is exclusive here to Shakespeare and Company. And we also got one of Heather's childhood favorite books that take place in Paris, which is Madeline. Both of those were able to get stamped with the bookstore's Shakespeare and Company official stamp. So we'll have those forever as keepsakes and memories of our time here in the city. It might be kind of cheesy, but we had to go with the Hunchback of Notre Dame since we can literally see Notre Dame right across the street. Although you're not allowed to take pictures in there and there's signs everywhere saying that, you can Google the inside to see all the charm and just how packed with books. Every nook and cranny is packed, even on the stairways up. If there was a spot, there was a book in it. Exactly what you would think of when you think of like a small, quaint, perfect bookstore in France. As we tucked away our books, I pulled out my hat because it's gotten a little chilly out here. As my Madeline book says, you can walk around Paris in rain or shine, so that's exactly what we're gonna go do. Another really cool thing about the bookstore itself is that if you're an aspiring writer, they have a program where you can live above the bookstore and work there and gain inspiration and have collaborative writing groups. So it's really supportive of aspiring artists, which is just something that makes that bookstore even more special. It's pretty unbelievable to be here. In 2019, there was a devastating fire that did an enormous amount of damage to this structure. Since then, they've been working on figuring out the best way to do restoration and are in the process of doing that now. On the sides of the cathedral, you can see the scaffolding. There are people working. So it is in the process of being restored to its former glory. It's really a great place to visit, even now, to see the work ongoing. But I think we'll have to absolutely come back and see it once it's finished and to be able to go inside the cathedral and view everything as it's meant to be seen. From Notre Dame, we are heading over to another 
famous cathedral here in Paris, this one, Saint-Chapelle. I have to say, for as incredible as Notre Dame is, as much history is in the Louvre, the Eiffel Tower, there's so many beautiful things. This has been something that I've been so excited to see ever since I learned about it when I was in college. I think that this is going to be one of the most beautiful buildings, the most beautiful interiors that we've ever been in, and I am so excited to get over to this next stop. We're almost there. I think it's just through this block and then we'll be in front of the building. Oh, is that it with the spire? I think so. The special thing about this cathedral are these incredible stained glass windows that are just enormous and have such a beautiful effect, especially on a sunny day, which we may not get as much of today, but I think seeing those just massive windows is going to be a highlight of our time here. We've joined a massive huddle of umbrellas as we have joined the queue to enter Saint-Chapelle. We have a timed entry of noon and we think we're standing in the right line, but there is a lot of other people who are also interested in seeing this attraction, so it must be something special. <laughs> just entering the building and it is as beautiful as you could hope it would be. The inside is filled with details and beautiful colors and the ceiling is exquisite. The stained glass is absolutely incredible. It's everything you would hope it would be. The fresco that's above the door to the left of the apse, which is the space here at the end of the church, is the oldest wall painting in Paris. So there's just so much here. The fleur-de-lis on the azure background on the ceilings are incredible. It, it's decorated from top to bottom and truly a great example of this style of architecture and place of worship. Getting a leg workout in. Yeah. This is the view that I was waiting for. Wow. Okay, this is impressive. In this space, there are 1,113 scenes depicted across the 15 stained glass windows depicting the story of humankind from Genesis up to the resurrection of Christ. The rose window is nine meters in diameter. Maybe the winters won't be so cold If we're together Maybe if it's you and me, we can weather all sorts of weather. Every inch of this place is just covered in so much detail from the floor to the windows to the walls to the ceiling and there's beautiful colors. The blue especially pops. It just is like almost looking at a <coughs> rainbow when you look at all the different stained glass windows. It's beautiful, just the details all throughout this space. Near the columns, the paintings on the wall are made to look like drapes and from a distance it does create that optical illusion. This was something that I was so excited to see and it absolutely lives up to the hype and the expectations. It was emotional to come into a space that you've thought about visiting so long and to finally have an opportunity to be here is everything I could have hoped it would be. We just exited Saint-Chapelle and Mike has been talking about this place ever since he learned about it in his art history classes. For those of you who don't know, he studied art history and classics and everything museum-y. So I've been hearing him talk about certain pieces and certain locations for years and this is one of them. And I'm just so excited to have shared this experience with him and he's right, it was absolutely beautiful. And we're off. We're walking past the outside of Saint-Chapelle now and it's just incredible to see the difference between the interior and the exterior of the space. The exterior is still exquisite with lots of detailed carvings, but the appearance of the stained glass, which is more muted on the outside compared to the absolute rainbow explosion of color that you see on the inside, is really interesting. So we're making our way to the Louvre. We're right now crossing the, not crossing Pont Neuf, but passing it on our side as we walk along the Seine. We 
have made it to Pont des Arts. Pont des Arts. Pont des Arts. I took Spanish in high school and Mike took French, so he's been correcting my pronunciation. So I do apologize in advance if I'm butchering all these words. But this used to be the Love Lock Bridge. It looks like they took them all down, but when I was here in 2012, this entire bridge was covered in locks. And it used to be tradition to come and put one up, to come as a couple and lock them to the bridge, meaning that your love was infinite, that it would never go anywhere. But I guess because it was actually weighing down the bridge so much, they took all the love locks off. It's still a beautiful bridge, but it definitely looks way different than it did back when it was covered in locks. Oh, walking across this bridge, a lot of the locks are missing, but you can see way up there that some of the locks survived, or people are defying the rule of not putting locks and putting them on there. You can see any space that it possibly could have a lock. People have decided that that's where the locks are going now. And you can see the Eiffel Tower from this bridge. So we're just in front of the entrance to the Louvre. You look left and some of the clouds have cleared and you can see the top of the Eiffel Tower. That cloud is what we were very much standing in when we made it to the top the other very night. Very true. We were in that cloud and waiting for it to move so that we could see the rest of the city. But having had the chance to explore a bit more, it's really incredible to just see the different layout of buildings in France and to have been around this city. You always kind of have to pinch yourself when you're here and just seeing the things that you've always dreamt of seeing. Ready? Let's go. To the Louvre. We are in similar line to the one that we were in at Saint-Chapelle where if you bought your tickets ahead of time you are in line as you get checked in so for the 2 p.m. line it goes around the pyramid but the line's moving pretty well. After about an hour, we have made it into the loop. There is so much to see that you would not be able to do it in a day and probably even a week. So we are going to look for the things that are kind of our must-sees and we're going to get to that now while we have a bit of time. The museum's open till 6, so we have like three hours to explore. And we've got a map. In this space right behind me is Hammurabi's Code, which is the oldest written law code in history. It has so much cultural significance to the world, and it's really incredible to see something that we learned about back in middle school and high school in the States. This would have been back in Mesopotamian times, and it has all the cuneiform. It's tall, probably seven feet tall, with just so much writing on it, it's incredible. We checked one thing off the list here that we need to see at the Louvre, on to the next. So the next thing on our list is the Sphinx, and I see it straight ahead. So this is the Great Sphinx of Tanis. It is known as the Guardian of the Louvre, and is one of the largest Sphinx that you'll see outside of Egypt. Our next stop here is going to be seeing the Venus de Milo, which is one of the most famous sculptures in the world. But one of the things that's most interesting is the mystery aspects of it. This is something that is believed to be Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, but without the arms, you're missing out on a lot of the symbolism that may have been in the sculpture. So it could have also been Amphitrite, who would have been one of the patron goddesses of the location this statue is found. So that mystery helps drive the interest in it. This is one of the busiest spots that we've been to in the museum so far because of how famous this sculpture is. So we've been making our way through the Richelieu and Sully wings, and we're heading now over to the Denon wing with the Mona Lisa. We had just waited in a very long line before we even got to the Denon room, because this is the line for Mona Lisa. So I would say that that artwork is definitely the most popular one. This, I think, is based off an actual event in French history. There was a ship that was crashed and so the people had managed to cobble together a raft. And one of the things that happened was during their time when they were at sea, like they survived on sea, there was like cannibalism, but a French ship actually passed by and didn't save them. So there was a big deal made when the survivors finally made it to land. But the artist had two people from that event model for him in order to get all the details correct. So 
I've come into the room with Mona Lisa. This is such a cultural icon. It's not as small as I thought it would be. It's not as big as most people think it is. But one of the things that made this piece originally famous was that it was actually stolen back in the early 1900s. I think that gave it its initial fame, but since then it's taken on a life of its own and has become world popular and is one of, if not the most popular pieces of art in the world. This is the winged victory of Samothrace, so that is the goddess Nike, the goddess of victory. You can see obviously the arms and head are missing, but the marble work is absolutely unbelievable. It is so amazing to see the detail, as well as just the, the skill of the artist who made this. We have exited the Louvre. Because the Louvre is just massive in size and has so many pieces in there. You wouldn't be able to see that all in a day, let alone a couple of hours like we had. So our plan of attack was to identify a couple of pieces that we knew we absolutely wanted to see, and we made sure to go visit those. So for us, it was a couple of the French historic paintings, the Mona Lisa, obviously, some really amazing sculpture work. We knew that we needed to go to those locations to make sure we had time to see them, especially because the museum closes at six. Our ticket was for two, but it took us about till three o'clock to get in. So we wanted to make sure we could see all of the things that were on our must-see list. I think it was very successful. We got to see a lot of the things that we wanted to do, wandered around a little bit, and now we're headed towards the Eiffel Tower, but hopefully a stop in between. Because it's November, there's Christmas markets everywhere, but we're here on a Monday, so I'm not sure if the Christmas markets really happen during the week, but we're about to go find out. Good news, there are Christmas markets currently going on, and there's one right outside the loo. We got bricolette. Bricolette. Bricolette, which is probably the thing that I wanted to try the most while we were here in France. Basically, it's just a bunch of cheese. Yeah. So we saw the person just slide the cheese off and put it onto a very tasty looking bread. But uh, yeah, we're starving at this point. We definitely worked up our appetite walking all around Paris and very excited to try this. This is like the best grilled cheese sandwich that you would ever have. And I know that's probably an insult, but it's the closest thing that I could say to it. But look at all this cheese and then the bread is perfectly toasted. This is definitely a great way to warm us up in the rainy, dreary weather. I took a really big bite, but that was great. The bread, they toast it so it's really nice. It goes really well with the cheese. They have ham and chicken as other options. We went with just cheese and I think it works perfectly. Like Heather said, it's just like the best grilled cheese sandwich. Also, across from where we got our amazing cheese bread sandwich is Santa. This is our first time being to any kind of European Christmas market and it's it's a blast. They have carnival rides, they have lots of cute shops, a lot of good smelling food. So we're gonna see if we can taste a few more goodies before we make our way on over to Eiffel Tower. Our next treat is a sweet one. We went with a sugar crepe as a counter to the savory with the cheese sandwich that we got. This one is really basic. They had a lot of options at the, the little booth that you could choose from, but I'm excited to give this one a try. It's great. It's really thin, covered in sugar, almost a sugar overload, but in a great way. And it is definitely delicious and a good counter to the savory meal that we just had. It's good. It's hard to get a bad crepe in France though. This is our first time trying chestnuts. We actually had to ask how to open them. Um, basically, you just peel them apart, but there's the meat on the inside. It looks pretty good. It's different, but it's good. <laughs> we figured we couldn't come to a Christmas market without trying chestnuts. It wasn't an open fire, but it was an oven, so that's close enough, right? He said to, as I dump all of them, he said to peel it and then eat the inside because we were almost just gonna shove the whole thing in our mouth, so I'm glad we asked. I don't even know what this tastes like. Not at all what I was expecting. I don't know what I was expecting. I think I was thinking more of like a peanut or some other sort of nut. It kind of tastes like a potato. I don't know if that makes sense, but 
there's not a lot of flavor other than it just being the nut. And it kind of has the texture of a potato, which is maybe why I'm thinking that it tastes like that, but it kind of just tastes like a bland potato. But I'm happy I tried it, because now I can officially say that I've had a chestnut on a fire, which uh, I really didn't even think these were a real thing outside of a Christmas song, so check that off the bucket list. Across the street from the Christmas market is this very famous cafe called Angelina's. We're here for one thing in particular, which is their hot chocolate. They're really well known for it, and I can't wait to dive in. So we have like a mini pitcher of the hot chocolate itself that we dump in and then we mix in the cream. Oh, this is, looks thick. Now the fun part. And I don't think this sits on top. We have to stir this in. I may have put too much in, but is there ever such a thing? That's really rich. It's thick chocolate, not too hot, which you usually have to wait forever for a hot chocolate to cool down so you can drink it right away. It's really, really good. Heather was right about it being very drinkable as soon as you get it. It's hot but it's not scalding, so you can dive right in. The cream sort of thickens up what's already a very thick hot chocolate. It's not overly sweet the way that we would expect it to be in America. It has just a hint of bitterness. It makes it feel like it has a real chocolate flavor of not just a packaged mix. It's really, really good. Now that we have finished our hot chocolate, there's only one thing left to do. I think we've stalled long enough. Head to the Eiffel Tower because we need to see it sparkle. Yes. Once it hits the night time, it starts twinkling. We can see it off into the distance but we need to get closer. As we're making our way towards the Eiffel Tower we kind of stumbled across the Champs-Élysées which at the end of it is the famous Luc de Triomphe. It's one of those things I didn't know if we would have time to see and to just sort of stumble upon it on our way to the Eiffel Tower is perfect. This day has just been as good as you could hope for. We've made it to the Eiffel Tower. We're just across the road from it so that way we can see as much of it as possible because every hour on the hour is when they turn on like the sparkly show. So it looks beautiful how it is all lit up, but it's about to get even more beautiful. When's it hits? Nine o'clock are we at? Eight. Eight o'clock. It's nearing up on eight o'clock. I think just five more minutes and it should sparkle. The sparkling has begun and it looks stunning. We could see it sparkling when it turned seven o'clock as we were going into Angelina's and I was so excited to see it up close. And here we are. It's also starting to sprinkle a little bit, but the sparkling even so now. We went to the top during the day and it was a little bit foggy, but I bet being on the top right now as it's sparkling looking out over the city would just be absolutely magical. And just like that it's over. It only lights up for five minutes on the top of every hour and then it goes back to just being lit. It's definitely worth waiting for. After a long day of exploring Paris, we took an Uber back from the Eiffel Tower and we are now at our hotel dry and warm. Or in the process of getting dry and warm. Yeah, we've hung up all of our wet stuff to hopefully dry overnight because we have another adventurous day tomorrow, so we're gonna need those. Paris was absolutely amazing. It was everything that I would have hoped for from a day that we had to visit and explore around the city. It kind of reminded me of Manhattan in New York City where there's just so many of those things that are iconic in the city that you can walk to pretty easily. Navigating through the city was really a breeze. I'm so glad that our scheduling let us have this longer layover here to really explore the city a little bit better. We would love to come back to France and do a little bit more of Paris as well as the rest of the country as a whole, but tomorrow we are doing something outside of Paris. We are going to Disneyland Paris. Heather and I are both huge Disney fans. It's we our toxic trait that we're Disney adults. <laughs> yeah, when we knew that we had the chance to be in Paris and could get over to Disneyland, we knew we had to do that, so we we are so excited to go there tomorrow. Also, our hotel is um, in downtown Paris and we have to take a bus to get out to Disneyland. But look at this wall feature. You can't tell me that that isn't a hidden Mickey. So it was meant to be. But on that note, we're gonna leave you here while we dry off all of our stuff and get a good night's sleep because we have a long day of walking and hanging out in Disneyland tomorrow. Yeah, I can't wait. Thank you all for joining us on this amazing day in Paris. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you have any questions about the things we did, booking tickets, anything like that, let us know in the comments. We'll be happy to answer them. But with that, we'll say good night and we'll see you in the next one. I'm living my best life. I wake up with the sunrise. It does not look a thing like Bad.